hepatitis B was a very serious infection. Um, it was known as a silent killer. In fact, um, way back, it was this a long, a long time ago, way back from 600 BC onwards, from the time of Hippocrates, it killed millions of people. It was uh, not identified as hepatitis B. It was called infectious jaundice. And uh, people who developed jaundice, many of them died because there was no specific antiviral treatment. There was, in fact, there was no treatment for it. Why is it called a silent infection? Because there were many who were not jaundiced, who developed the serious uh, sequelae of chronic infection. Uh, the virus inhabits in the liver, and what it does is damages the liver, causing hardening of the liver, we call it cirrhosis, which leads on to bleeding, internal hemorrhages, severe hemorrhages, and people die from that. Well, and more importantly, it also was a virus cause of liver cancer. At that time, it was the number one cancer in Singapore, um, and also the number one cancer in the Asia-Pacific region. For the world, it would be the top eight, one of the top eight. So, so in terms of cost, cost in, there was a cost in lives and cost in money, as far as Singapore is concerned. Cost in life, it, those who died were in the 40s to 50s. These are the crucial manpower age groups. So at that time in Singapore, we could not afford to lose critical manpower. Um, in terms of cost in looking after them in hospital, um, it was about $5 million. $5 million might look trivial today, but in fa at that time, we could, we could buy uh, chicken rice for $1. So we can look at the, the cost, it was quite costly. Costly to families, costly to society, losing a, a member. Hepatitis B vaccine is a new technology. And um, there were only two manufacturers of a world-class name who made the vaccine. One was the French manufacturer Pasteur. They had already started in 1978 to vaccinate in Senegal. The other manufacturer was Merck Shop and Dome. Um, and they started to manufacture in 1981. We knew way back in 1981 that vaccines were going to be available. It's not a simple task just to vaccinate anybody. First of all, number one is the safety and efficacy. Secondly, we had to know who were immune and who were not immune, who had to be vaccinated. So between 1982, March 82 to 83, we did uh, uh, serial uh, surveillance studies, checking blood from children to adults. Uh, I think there were some uh, 600 people. And what we found that 9% of the population were infected, many children. And these children and adults, many of them were quiet. They didn't know they had hepatitis B. At that time, reagents were also very crude. So they could, not, they could only pick uh, up about 30% of hepatitis B. Uh, when vaccines became available, we started our first clinical trials in 1983. Starting first, I think I was, I'm the first one who was vaccinated, being the non-immune, followed by my... my uh, research staff members. Uh. So we are one of the 10 that vaccines was available. It was also costly. Um, vaccines was not so much available at the time. It would cost about $100 Sing Singapore dollars per dose of vaccine, and we need three doses. Uh. So why did we start? We had to start cautiously. Safety was an issue. We did not know whether people would die, people get mean, or complications from it. So we had to go very slowly. So when the first 600 people, including myself, were alive without any trouble, we knew at least within our local usage, it was a fairly safe vaccine. And then, then we had to plan a national strategy because vaccines were expensive. 
not available. And we went into consideration of manufacturing in Singapore. Um, and that's how I, was, I got involved in it. Because the government gave me a research grant for 1.5 million to develop a, a vaccine. And that project led us to uh, be involved with the World Health Organization because we had to know how to make it at world-class level because it's a question of safety, you know, human safety now. At that time, when we started, Singapore had no industries. Uh, we had no A-stars. Our PhD students or PhDs, where were they? They were not in the industry. They were in the universities teaching. So the only people who were actually working on vaccine production was my research staff, which had uh, PhD students there, no PhD graduates there. Uh, but we managed to develop a vaccine which was able to produce an antibody when challenging the animals. Uh, that was the limit as, we, as far as we can go. So we, in, order, in order to leapfrog we had to go to the industries. And the industries also came to, to Singapore because they were very excited that Singapore was going to make vaccine. Um, and when I approached the World Health Organization in Geneva, the chief of biologics, uh, Dr. Perkins, in fact, was very delighted that Singapore is going to set up manufacturing. In fact, they wanted Singapore to be a manufacturing base for vaccines for the whole region. And this is way back in 1983. To me, that's, that sounded a, a, a very long-distance dream. We had no molecular science, we have no body. You don't even have regulators. In fact, uh, at that time, I became the regulator for Ministry of Health on the use and safety of vaccines. You know? um, so that's how we, how we got started. Now, we didn't start until 9, October 1985. Uh, on a national program. Before we got started, we had to get vaccine. And it's not easy to get vaccine. How did we get it? We were very close and linked to WHO. Of all the countries, WHO countries, we were the ones in Asia in which uh, WHO had a keen interest. Number one, we knew we were interested in vaccinating our population of susceptible. Susceptible ones were all young people, like the ones like you all sitting down here, under 20. None of you were immune. Any of you who get it could die of hepatitis. Like we lost some of our medical students, some of our nursing staff, and doctors, who handled patients who had hepatitis. Without knowing that they had hepatitis, got it and died. You know? So we had to vaccinate, and that was about 200,000 people. The, our cancer registry was started by the uh, International Agency for Research in Cancer, which is WHO in Lyon. So they came to, came to Singapore frequently. And we had a cancer race base. Uh, uh, <clears throat> we had research, and government, and university support. So we had the uh, infrastructure for evaluating the, the outcome of vaccination. So uh, both Geneva and Lyon were very keen for Singapore for two reasons. Number one, um, they wanted to uh, IRC wanted to know what was the outcome of liver cancer before and after vaccination. Was it worthwhile? When we, um, we, when we were tasked with that, many of us wondered how many of us are going to be around in 25 or 50 years' time. Because it's not going to be a one-time project where you know the answer. Okay. Um, secondly, the vaccine is costly. At least one country in the world has to show that the vaccine was worthwhile, worth the millions of dollars paid. And one country in the world, at least, had to show safety and efficacy. And not only just as a one-time injection, the durability of the vaccination. That means when the children were vaccinated at birth, will the vaccine 
uh, immunity lasts for life. Singapore was chosen because we are, number one, we are a uh, WHO country. You know? um, other countries like Taiwan, which was mentioned, Taiwan is not in WHO. No, China was too vast and hasn't even started. America was too vast, but they had a lot of uh, human rights. So they had great trouble in starting. Uh, Hong Kong, Hong Kong um, did not have a national uh, registry. So many, even Japan did not have a national cancer registry. Only Singapore had a national registry. So these are the reasons why WHO chose Singapore. We had the infrastructure, we had the people, we had the logistics to monitor. Non monitor not just for two or three years, practically for life. When we um, uh, embarked on the program, um, WHO recommended a number of people to us. Uh, and to make it at world class level and, and for it to be regulated, one of the highest authority is the, uh, is the uh, FDA. And uh, Mokshap and Dom had already made a vaccine. Now, the vaccine, um, the discoverer of vaccine is Professor Baruch Bloomberg, who won the Nobel Prize for it in 1978. He's a, he's a doctor scientist. Um, we are very good friends. We, you know, so we, we do communicate quite often. And he had actually patented the vaccine. And he gave his patent, his license over to Mokshap and Dome because he wanted to help humanity. But he also licensed it to the French, to Pasteur. So we, we, although we had made the vaccine, we could not use it because of licensing. But... Singapore and, and the Americans were very friendly. And uh, WHO also wanted Singapore to become a manufacturing base. So at that time, the Singapore government was tinkering on whether it should go into biotechnology. That's before ASTARS came up, before IMCB came up. And... Um, Advisors who came here include um, Nobel Prize laureates who came here, advisors the Singapore government. In fact, they met with our Prime Minister then, uh, the late Lee Kuan Yew, Go King Sui. And uh, I remember the conversation which is published. You know, and uh, Prime Minister at that time says, we are a, we are a trading nation. You know, we are in a nation of uh, workmen, you know. And he got a reply from the Nobel Prize laureate. Uh, if you want to be a tradesman, you you always be a tradesman. But the future is in R and D, research and development. And Go King Sui, who was, who was a minister of education at the time, had a vision to see that Singapore had no choice. We have to go to R and D. We have to, and R and D will be the basis in which products from Singapore will go out and make the income for us. It was a very brave decision because we were nothing. So what it meant is a whole university, school, edu uh, curriculum all got to be changed and ramped up to higher level technology. So that many of you, like those of you here who are in the science class, will be doing um, uh, things such as uh, DNA testing or sequencing, which was what my lab technicians were doing at that time. So that was the stage in which Singapore um, took off. So they came and they found Singapore was very interested and Singapore was very, and we went into a joint venture. Eventually, Merckstrap and Dome decided to come to Singapore to set up manufacturing so we can train our people here. And yeah, so about um, today, there are many, there are many uh, industries here. Merckstrap and Dome is here. But um, the first manufacture of vaccines, or hepatitis B vaccine, was uh, Smith Klein and Beach of SKB. I think it's around 2005, some 10 years later. By that time, we had been able to train a lot of PhDs from IMCB.
to industry. The decision was twofold. There was an urgent need. When you have dying people, the, the cheapest program would be education, prevention. We went into prevention because we knew of the various ways in which hepatitis was transmitted through needles, through sexual transmission. But from mothers, infected mothers, or within families where the hepatitis B, the only way is vaccine. So we have to get access to vaccine. But if vaccine is so expensive, the other way is to make it yourself. And we start at the time, looking back at the time, um, it was a brave challenge. But today we might look at it as a naive thought, you know, with the advances that has gone on. But we have access a big pool of carriers, human plasma with carriers. And we know how to purify, isolate the virus from that. So why not? Let's try it out. You know? And that's the motivation for us to go from um, research to industrial development. Yeah. And we needed a big partner, FDA approved and experienced in manufacturing vaccines. And that's how vaccine came to Singapore. Looking back over the last 30 years, this is one of the greatest achievements by Singapore. The success of the vaccination program it's one of our greatest, I would say, greatest contribution to the world in terms of prevention of, uh, of a very dangerous infection, as well as a prevention of a major cancer in the world, liver cancer. Um, the importance of what Singapore did was we were able to introduce it into the existence vaccination of childhood. No one at that time know how to do it. They had done pilot studies, like we have done pilot studies. We have vaccinated children to see whether it's safe or effective. Well, next, next thing is you really introduce into the existing immunization program where within the whole country, you have to get everybody coordinated <laughs> doing the same thing, knowing when to do and what. And also to find out whether your BCG, your triple, your dipure tetanus uh, whooping cough will, effect will be diminished by the vaccine or increased or more side effects of it. No one knows, you know? and, but we dare to go ahead and do it and watch and monitor. And but, um, by the grace of God, we had no disasters for 25 years. At that time, people were thinking you might get mad cow disease. You're going to get cancer from this because in fact, one famous uh, cancer specialist says, from America says, you're using the virus component which causes cancer. You're going to cause a lot of cancers. <laughs> well, fortunately, this was debunked because it's not the uh, HBSG particle, it's this vaccine, but the nucleic acid of the virus that causes it. So, so the study, in fact, proved that it was wrong. I think we, if we look back, many of you, many of us were, were not born before the war. No, I was a, a wartime baby, so we, um, from that time period, uh, disease was quite rampant. Infectious diseases were quite rampant, from malaria. Today we see dengue, still here, uh, but and this is a cholera, typhoid, polio which paralyzed people. In fact, one of the earliest vaccine trials conducted in Singapore was the polio vaccine, salt vaccine, in the 1950s. And it was a very learning lesson because it showed us that if we vaccinate at least 95% of the population covered, you wipe up polio. In fact, we wipe up polio. And this became our strategy for our hepatitis B vaccination. You must cover at least 95%. So if 95% of the population is immune, there's no chance of it spreading elsewhere. So that, uh, that information was very useful to us. Uh, in, later, in later years, it would be HIV, AIDS, and SARS, you know, and uh, airborne infections. This, very, this hepatitis uh, 
vaccine program. In fact, I was the chairman of the first uh, Ministry of Health Advisory Committee on Hepatitis and Related Disorders. The related disorders is very expanded because we had to tackle AIDS. The information we got in tackling infectious disease was very useful. Number one, um, isolation quarantine of the of the identified cases immediately, so that's containment of spread, a tracer of all, all, all these people. We are very lucky because we have identity card, you know, ICs, we can trace people. Um, next thing is to have a very good laboratory, infectious disease laboratory, fully equipped in P1. That means high containment facility, that means you have to be gowned up in space suits to go inside there, you know, in a, in a very protective environment and have a depository very well indexed with all the material, the serum, the sputum, the urine, everything, tissues stored there. And the third thing is to have top class PhD students, not students, PhD uh, molecular scientists, so that we could quickly identify the infectious agent, develop an assay, uh, either immunoassay or uh, or DNA or RNA uh, probes, something very fast. So it can be quickly used to identify. And the third one is to be linked. Like I, when I was working, we are linked with WHO laboratories around the world. So we shared information, critical information, which was not public. See? So those are vital so, uh, to containing, containing infections. I think Singapore is the country that can prove it. But, but we have to do it. Because we have no choice, because we are the crossroad of international travel, and people can zoom in from uh, Ebola country straight into Singapore. <laughs> you may not know he's got. He, he would deny he went to Ebola country, but he, you have to catch him before you get uh, epidemic starting in Singapore. <laughs>